Warren Morris. It's a deep drive down the right field line. That ball is gone! LSU wins the college. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the 60 Feet, 6 Inches LSU podcast. As always, thank you all for joining me. In this episode, I will review the Monday night LSU versus Butler game. I will go over some stats from the four-game weekend stretch in which LSU was completely dominant. I will take a look at how LSU stacks up statistically and some of the major hitting and pitching categories versus the rest of the country. What were the three big things that I learned from the weekend series about the Tigers? How did I do on my get right, stay right predictions? And then finally, the SEC rundown. As always, you can find the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, and other major audio platforms. If you're viewing this on the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU pod YouTube channel, please make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of the content throughout the season. On Twitter, the account is at 60FT6IN. LSU pod. Once again, that's at 60FT6IM LSU pod. Hit that notifications bell and interact with me on Twitter as well. So if you missed the last episode, we went live. It's something we're trying to do this year after some Sunday series. We went live on YouTube and Twitter two hours after the conclusion of the LSU Sunday game for an instant analysis of the Friday through Sunday game versus Butler and Central Connecticut State. On the live stream, I was joined by Matthew Musso from the Musso at the Box podcast on 104.5 ESPN in Baton Rouge, and then Stephen Miller, Mr. LSU. So in that episode, we really got into each game individually and provided more, excuse me, and provided more in-depth analysis than this wrap-up episode will provide. So if you didn't get a chance to check that out, please check on the YouTube channel underneath the live section or on the Twitter account for links back to that live streaming episode. It's also available on podcast version as well. So let's get into it. LSU versus Butler in a rare Monday night game at the box to wrap up this four game stretch. LSU wins this game by 10 run rule, which seemed to be the theme of the weekend as they won 11 to nothing in seven innings. LSU scored early and often and essentially put this game to bed after the six-run second inning by the Tigers. This game saw LSU score one in the first, six in the second, one in the fourth, and the fifth, and then finally two in the sixth to put the Bulldogs away. You saw Dylan Cruz hit his third home run of the year in the first with a solo shot to center field. You also saw Brady Neal, the freshman, get off the snide as he hit his first bomb for the Tigers in the second inning. And then followed that, LSU followed that with four straight hits, which eventually led to six runs in that inning as well. In the fourth, you saw another freshman, Paxton Kling, who got the start in right field again for LSU. He hit his first home run in the purple and gold with a solo shot in the fourth. And LSU just continued to tack on more runs in the fifth and the sixth to finish off a rough weekend for Butler. Some things to note in this game, Cade Beloso, the Creole Bambino, Got his first start at first base for LSU as he's been playing really well in a pinch hitting role as he hit two home runs on the weekend for the Tigers. He started in place of the struggling Jared Jones, but to Beloso's credit, I think he earned that start and he's been on absolute fire as he had two more hits tonight. For the year, Beloso's hitting 636 with seven hits and 11 ABs, two home runs and a double. So great job of that young man as he's gutted it out, stuck it out at LSU and battled through a bunch of injuries himself. And I think you're going to see him get more playing time and possibly another start at first base versus Lamar on Wednesday night. I think he continues to deserve that spot as of right now. The only other surprise in the lineup was Joe Bear moving down to the nine hole after his struggles this weekend. He's hit some ball hard, really had been right at him, but, um, He had a rough weekend. I think he was one for 11 before coming into the Monday night game. So look, enough of the hitters. I feel like I've buried the lead on the Monday night game versus Butler long enough. To me, it was all about Thatcher Hurd and his dominating pitching performance on the mound. I had a feeling on Saturday after Floyd started that we would see Hurd on Monday in hopes of him possibly moving to the weekend rotation and then throwing Sunday versus Sanford coming up. And boy, 
did he look ready to assume that role after tonight. All he did was strike out the first six batters of the game for Butler. Tonight was the Thatcher Heard from UCLA that Tiger fans have heard so much about and have been waiting to see, and you saw it tonight. He was the number seventh ranked transfer portal player, and tonight with his fastball, he sat 95 to 96 the whole night, showed a very consistent and wipeout slider at 89 to 90. He also flashed a change and a curveball as well, both for strikes. Hurd was efficient and effective all night. So in the game versus Butler, Hurd goes six innings pitched, three hits, one walk, and 11 Ks. In his previous six and two-thirds outing before tonight, Hurd had allowed six walks. But tonight you didn't see that at all. And it was mainly inconsistency with his fastball. He was just missing. It's not like he was throwing the ball to the backstop, right? He was just missing a little up, a little out, a little in, driving up his pitch count. And you saw him pound the zone tonight. You saw him finish off hitters with efficiency. And whatever mechanical issue that may have been going on, or maybe something in that headspace of his, it seems to have been fixed when he faced Butler tonight. He looked like an ace out there. He threw 73 pitches in six innings pitched, and that's with 11 Ks. I mean, you want to talk about effective and efficient. Even after LSU had that long six-run second inning, Hurd came out there and threw six pitches. After striking out the first six Butler hitters, he got three quick fly balls and got the Tiger hitters back in the dugout. I really thought, and I said this on Twitter, that they may take him out early to save him for Sunday. But on the broadcast, Ronnie Rance alluded to the fact that the plan was to get him up to 75 pitches tonight. So we will just have to wait and see what the plan is for him after this outing. He would effectively have five days off if he did pitch again on Sunday. And if that was the case, I don't think you have him follow Chase Shores. I think, if anything, you have Chase Shores follow her. If you don't want to run up his pitch count after throwing 75 pitches on Monday, maybe he gets three innings. Four innings against Sanford, maybe he's capped at a 40 to 50 pitch limit, and then you let Chase Shores follow him in his usual Sunday spot. But regardless, fabulous outing by that young man. I'm very happy for him. Hopefully he can now relax in the purple and gold and just go out there and do his job. You saw good things from him in the fall, in the spring, but I just can't wait for him to build upon that success, and he could be a massive piece behind Paul Skeens in that weekend rotation wherever Hurd eventually slots in. <clears throat> so let's get into some stats from the weekend and also how does LSU stack up nationally? Some crazy stats. I think some things y'all will find very surprising for this Tiger team heading into the Sanford weekend. So let's want, let's focus on the four game stretch right now. So LSU won 12 to 2, 26 to 4, 13 to nothing, 11 to nothing, outscoring their opponents 62 to 6 during this four game stretch. I'm going to break this up into pitchers and hitters. Let's first concentrate on the pitchers for the four-game stretch. In 30 innings pitched, LSU's pitchers only gave up 15 hits and six earned runs. That is a 1.8 team ERA. Fabulous job by Wes Johnson and his staff. When you look at the starting pitchers specifically, it is absolutely bonkers what these guys did. So I'm talking about Skeens, Floyd, Shores, and Hurd. Those four starters combined for 21 and one-third innings pitched. They only gave up 10 hits, one earned run, one earned, four walks, and 21 and a third innings pitched, and 34 Ks. Fabulous. Dominant stuff by those guys. That's good for an eight-and-a-half to one strikeout-to-walk ratio and a paltry 0.42 ERA by those starters. And I get it. Some of you are shaking your head saying, I get it, Chris. Yeah, but that's what they're supposed to do. You're right. The competition was not great. Central Connecticut State, their first game outside all year. Butler is having a very rough go of it early on. But in the end, you beat who's on the schedule, and they did that with ruthless efficiency. Compared to some of the other SEC teams, I would say their schedule's right in the middle. Definitely not the toughest schedule, definitely not the weakest. Just look at Alabama for that. But, like, they haven't played teams like Ole Miss or Vanderbilt have played, you know. But in the end, you beat who you can, whoever they put in front of you, and they did it in a dominant fashion. Back to the pitchers. As a staff, 
LSU's pitchers threw 60, 66% strikes on the weekend. Two out of three pitches were, were strikes. And that's one thing I've been paying attention to in the stats. When I go and come through with some information, it looks like they've sat between 60 to 70% strikes almost all year. I would imagine that's a point of emphasis for Wes Johnson and the other coaches is, look, especially in college baseball, just don't walk guys. Make them put the ball in play. And the way our defense is playing, let's pick it up, throw it the first, or catch the fly ball and get the out. For the weekend, all pitchers, 10 walks, 47 Ks, almost a 5-to-1 strikeout to walk ratio. A fabulous job by all of those arms for the LSU staff during the four-game stretch. Let's move on to the hitters. Now, LSU faced a ton of left-handed pitching. Shocker, right? Three of the four starters they faced were left-handed, but LSU managed to hit nine home runs on the weekend. They actually walked more times than they struck out. Yes, you heard me correctly. LSU walked 27 times and only struck out 23 times, and that's coming off a four-game stretch in which the Tiger hitters struck out 54 times and I believe a 16 strikeout performance versus Texas in the midweek last week. Now, LSU did have 11 strikeouts versus Butler on Friday night versus the changeup specialist and left-handed starter Graverson, but they managed to adjust, changed up their approach, and did a fabulous job throughout the rest of the weekend. In terms of scoring, I really wanted to see LSU put up um, runs in multiple innings, and I think you saw that in abundance during this four-game stretch. LSU scored in 18 of the 26 innings they played this weekend. So in terms of the chances they had to hit, obviously they're not going to hit in the home half of the seventh if they're, it's a 10-run rule in effect. So 18 out of the 26 innings played, they scored. So roughly 70% of the innings, the Tigers put up runs this weekend. Fabulous job by Jay Johnson and his crew there. When you dig a little deeper in terms of the hitters, check this out. With runners in scoring position, LSU hit 439 versus Butler and CCU. They were 29 for 66. This is the absolute gold-plated money stat of the weekend. You want to impress your friends, your coworkers. You want to throw something in your buddy's face who thinks he knows a lot about baseball. Here you go. This is crazy to me. And this must be a team goal. must be up on some board in the locker room or something. With runners on third base. And less than two outs. The ultimate goal is to try to get that runner home no matter what. LSU was 17 for 19 over this four-game stretch with runners on third base and less than two outs. You want to talk about driving in runs when you have to have them. Keeping the inning going. Continuing to put pressure on the pitcher and get that zero off the scoreboard. That is 895. 17 for 19. 895 if you're keeping track at home. That is freakish and that is think about it when you move into sec play the pitching is going to get tougher they have better stuff the relievers are better they're going to throw harder they're going to throw more strikes they're going to have better breaking stuff obviously that number is going to go down but it, as long as that is a focus for this team and you're in those one run battles if you can scratch across a run late in the game if you can drive that runner home even with a ground ball with a sack fly with a swinging bunt whatever it is you were doing your job as a hitter. 17 for 19. Nuts. Now let's take a look at some of the national stats. I felt like this was a good time. You've had enough sample size throughout the country. Most teams have played, you know, 11 and 12 games right there where LSU is. Is there 11 and 1 on the year? So I did some digging. So the national stats, I did all the calculations for y'all. I did the math. This includes the Butler game as of last night. We'll go pitching first. Pitching, LSU has thrown 100 innings pitched on the year. They have given up 64 hits. That is 5.76 hits per nine innings pitched. That is good for third. Yes, third in the country. I don't care who you're facing in college baseball, metal bats. Anytime you're giving up 5.76 hits per nine innings pitched, you have a phenomenal staff. LSU leads the country in shutouts with four. The pitching staff is only giving up 2.7 walks per nine innings pitched, which is good for 11th in the country. That, they're actually, 
So they're 11th in the country, and Lamar, the team that LSU is facing on Wednesday night, is 10th. So that'll be an interesting battle between those two pitching staffs. When you look at team ERA around the country, LSU ranks 16th with a team ERA of 2.88. Absolutely phenomenal job by that staff. I mean, 2.88, I mean, you know, if, if you're, if you think about it, if you fast forward 20 games and you're still under three, you're going to be probably in the top seven in the country when you look at team ERA. Those stats are disgusting. So quality of arms, the ability to attack the zone, the mindset, the secondary pitches, and the ability to finish off hitters. You can have great stuff, but if you can't finish hitters off or make a pitch with two strikes or you go 3-2 all the time and you're putting guys on base, which obviously LSU doesn't as they're 11th in the country in terms of walks per nine innings pitch, hats off to Wes Johnson and what he's been able to do with these talented arms in just a short time that he's been on campus. Let's move over to the hitting side of things. LSU has a team batting average of 339, which ranks ninth in the country. Now, remember, this is including last night's stats versus Butler on Monday. LSU, LSU <laughs> this is hilarious. LSU is tied for seventh in hit by pitch. So that's no surprise to anyone. I think we constantly see LSU get plunked. In terms of walks, LSU ranks in the top 20. And this is something I heard on the broadcast this weekend that Jay Johnson preaches. And I think he calls it the free base war. I could be completely mistaken, but I thought I heard Rance or Ben McDonald mention that um, during this four game set. When he talks about the free base war, he's talking about walks, hit by pitch, and possibly something else. I'm not sure if he's talking about errors, but it's a big focus for this team. And it's a way to continually put pressure on pitchers and the defense. And finally, LSU is third in the country in on base percentage. Circle back to the walks, the hit by pitch, the free base war, third in the country in on base percentage at 472. They're almost getting on the base half the amount of time. Every one, almost every one out of two times they come up to the plate, the LSU hitter is getting on base. That's nuts. Fielding, the bugaboo from last year. You want to talk about put a gold-plated star, wear a medal around your neck, whatever you want to do. LSU is tied for second in the country. Yes, second in the country with only three errors through their 12 games. Good for a 992 fielding percentage, actually tied with Ole Miss. I don't care who you play, where you play. Anybody that's hitting ground balls to you at the college level, you got to make plays. They didn't do that last year. I think their fielding percentage was in the 960s. 12 games in, second in the country. Fabulous job. Fabulous job by Thompson. I want to point out him specifically. Everybody, and Trey Morgan's been at first base. I mean, excuse me, left field. So he's not like he's over there saving a ton of runs. Thompson has looked fabulous. Dugas has been solid. Napolt has been really good at third base while Tommy White has been injured. So hats off to the LSU fielders. As a pitcher, you want to know when that ball's put in play, those guys are going to suck it up, make the play, and they've done that with a 992 second in the country fielding percentage. Just an amazing start as LSU continues to remain ranked the number one team in the country. Regardless of schedule, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They had a lot of expectations, a lot of pressure put on them with the number one ranked portal class, number one ranked high school recruiting class. And so far, they've had some hiccups along the way, but you see – them really gelling right now. I think Jay Johnson has a good idea of where guys are starting to slot in. There's still going to be some moving parts before SEC play, maybe even in the beginning of SEC play. And then once again, as Tommy Tanks is able to throw and man third base, but it looks like there's a, a ton of good juju, a ton of good vibes on this team. They're really pulling for each other. They're competing with each other, but not in a good way. Nobody's pouting or sulking. It seems like obviously I'm not behind the scenes, but just a great feeling to, to this team early on is they have one more final weekend series before SEC play starts. All right, three big things from this weekend. What did I learn? One, the lineup. When this lineup is locked in, albeit versus lesser competition this weekend, they can be dangerous one through nine. We always talk about the depth of the lineup. You don't want all your good hitters to be one through five and then six, seven, eight, nine are free outs. One through nine, this lineup is stacked. 27 walks and 23 Ks on the weekend just shows me how locked in they were, especially after striking out 11 times on Friday night. White and Morgan are beginning to heat up. 
You add that to Cruz and Dugas, who are already red hot, and then a steady Jordan Thompson hitting around 350. Then you bring on the freshman, what Neal's been able to do, what Jones has been able to do with his power, even though he's scuffling just a little bit. Then what Kling showed this weekend, this lineup should be primed and ready to go to face those SEC arms in two weeks. The second big thing that I learned, the starting pitching. Absolutely dominant this weekend. I already gave you the numbers, but a 0.42 starting ERA with an 8.5 to 1 strikeout to walk ratio is absolutely phenomenal. I think the fact that they only gave up four free passes in terms of the starting pitchers and then the staff as a whole threw 66% strikes on the weekend may be the most impressive stat. You also saw Ty Floyd get his chance to start on Saturday. And then you saw Thatcher Hurd get his chance to start on Monday. And to me, both look great. They dominated, they pounded the zone, and they made Butler and CCU, CCSU, excuse me, put the ball in play, and they weren't able to hurt you. I look forward to seeing both Hurd and Floyd continue that progress, build off these past weekend performances, and hopefully solidify their spot in the weekend rotation heading into SEC play. I think Chase Shores continues to improve. Look, as a freshman, the more amount of time he gets, the more comfortable he becomes with himself, with his mechanics, with his secondary pitches, with the competition. Every team he goes to face out there is another challenge. And they continue to build him up, you know, two, three, four innings. And if he does bump into a midweek starter role, I wouldn't be surprised to see him go four or five innings against some of those teams that he will be facing. The last of the three big things that I learned from this weekend, the depth on this team is great. I think the options that Jay Johnson and Wes Johnson have at their disposal is starting to pay dividends. This is really the first weekend where you saw a ton of guys get in the game early and they were able to produce and show what they could do. I think Paxton Kling may have solidified his spot in right field moving forward. Neal continues to look great behind the plate for a freshman. Jared Jones, he may be scuffling a little bit at the moment, <clears throat> but he is a huge power threat and we know he can go off at any time. But I think the big winner on the weekend for the four-game set, as I said it earlier, apparently that's his nickname. We determined on Twitter, the Creole Bambino, Cade Beloso, hits two home runs, another double, and he gets his first start of the year at first base on Monday night versus Butler. And also Ethan Fry has been swinging the bat very well when he comes off the bench and gets his chances to hit. Then you have Gavin Guidry, who came in relief out of nowhere, and he strikes out four in his relief appearance. The Gatorade Player of the Year from Louisiana, the shortstop from Barb, and oh yes, he can fling it too on the bump. He looked lights out. But then you still have vets, not necessarily on the bench, that are going to rotate in, take some pressure off the young guys, and they can start midweek games and SEC games moving forward. I'm talking about specifically Napolt, Pearson, Stevenson, Travinsky, Malazzo. A ton of depth on this roster, and you really saw it shine this weekend. All right, the get right, stay right list. How did your guy do? Get right. I had Tommy White. That is a definite hit. Over the four-grain stretch, Tommy Tanks went 7 for 12. He hit 583, two doubles, two home runs, nine RBIs, zero walks for the big guy, and four hit by pitches. On the year, his batting average is up to 367. Nice to see Tanks getting hot, coming into his own. He had a phenomenal four-game stretch this weekend. Another hit for me on the get-right list, Trey Morgan. Morgan hit 538. He went 7 for 13 with three doubles and a triple on Monday night. He had three RBIs, two walks, and zero Ks. So no Ks between Morgan and Tanks on the weekend. And Trey is up to 359 on the year. So those guys continue to stay hot, continue to get better and better as they get more ABs. The other guy I had on the get right list, this was a miss for me, is Bryce Collins. He is still struggling out the pin in the early going. And in his one outing this weekend, Collins pitched on Saturday. One and a third innings pitched, two hits, three runs, three earned, two walks, and zero Ks. Hopefully he can regain his form very soon. I think he is a key piece moving forward, especially as conference play looms on the horizon. A ton of experience. He played at Arizona with Jay Johnson. I think he's going to turn around, so we just hope he gets uh, – all of his control issues or whatever's going on sorted out very soon. On the stay right side of things, two for two, baby. Dylan Cruz, that's a hit. 
five for 14 on the weekend. You saw his average dip a little bit. It's going to, of course it is. He was sitting like 516, I think, coming into Friday night. Five for 14 on the weekend for Cruz. That's good for 357. He had two home runs and three doubles, four walks, and three Ks. He's hitting 463 on the year. And the thing that has impressed me so much with Cruz this year, and I mentioned it on the live stream uh, right after the game on Sunday with Musso and Stephen Miller, when you look at Cruz, watch him next time when he gets two strikes. He is so locked in. He really thus far has eliminated. He used to swing at a lot of pitches above his hands, a lot of high pitches, or he would chase some breaking balls out the zone. To me, he has eliminated that so far this year. Maybe a little tougher in SEC competition with the stuff those guys are going to be seeing. But he just looks locked in. And I even said, could he be better this year than he was last year? And that's saying a lot. And that's yet to be determined. But, man, he looks like he is not pressing. And now that Tommy White's getting hot and they have Morgan in front of him or behind him sometimes, they can't necessarily pitch around him because you know they're not going to give him anything to hit. But with White and Morgan heating up around him, that means Cruz is going to see more pitches to hit. And that's a good thing for LSU fans. Finally, last on my stay right list, another hit for me, Ty Floyd. On the weekend, great outing on Saturday. I think everybody, after his couple of relief appearances where he absolutely dealt, everybody was ready to see him step into the starting rotation, which is where he finished 2022. And as a reminder, Floyd, on Saturday, five and two-thirds, three hits, one run, one earned, one walk, six Ks. The only run was somebody, uh, Rios, for CCSU, caught a fastball, hit it out the park in the first. It was a solo shot. No big deal. He shakes it off and deals after that. Hopefully, we see him in the weekend rotation moving forward. And with that performance, he can build upon his success and solidify his spot. It, whether or not he's on Saturday or Sunday after schemes, it doesn't matter to me. But Ty Floyd definitely has the stuff to be a weekend starter. All right. One of the newer segments here on the pod, the SEC Rundown. How did the competition do on the weekend? Well, you saw Tennessee, Alabama, Auburn, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Mizzou, and LSU all sweep. I'll go 3-0 on the weekend. Once again, Tennessee, Bama. Auburn, Kentucky, Arkansas, Mizzou, and then LSU. In Minneapolis, Ole Miss and Vanderbilt took place in the took part in the Cambria Classic. Vandy went two and one, and then Ole Miss slugged their way to a three and zero tournament record in, in Minneapolis. Georgia and South Carolina both took two games from their in-state rivals, Georgia Tech and Clemson, respectively. Florida took two out of three games from the Canes, with some resounding wins in there. The Aggies struggle a little bit in Shriners, but they had to go extra innings late Sunday night as they get two wins in Houston. And then finally, Mississippi State went up to North Dallas in Frisco, and they had a very rough go of it as they dropped two out of three games on the weekend. Looking ahead for LSU, they play a very good Lamar team on Wednesday night at the box. Lamar has already beaten Texas A&M, so I'm sure Lamar will be up and ready for that game. They have a very good pitching staff doing some early research. Doesn't look like they swing the bat very well. But as we mentioned, a very good team ERA earlier in the show. And this weekend, LSU hosts Samford out of Birmingham at the box Friday through Sunday. Their final non-conference weekend before LSU kicks off SEC play as they travel to Texas A&M. So that's going to do it for this pod as we did the review of the Monday night game. LSU versus Butler, and we did a you know, final weekend recap of the Butler and CCSU series, really focusing on some stats, both in that series and then how LSU stacks up nationally hitting and pitching. Be on the lookout for the next podcast as I review the Lamar game and give you a preview of the Stanford series to come. As a reminder, subscribe to the YouTube channel for all of the content, and then follow me on Twitter at 60 feet. Six inches LSU pod. Once again, that's at 60FT, 6IN LSU pod. This podcast will be available on Google, Apple, Spotify, other major audio platforms. If you didn't get a check, chance to check out the live instant analysis that me, Musso, and Stephen Miller did on Sunday night, that is on the YouTube channel page underneath the live section. Y'all can check that out. There's also a link on my Twitter account. So with that, Tiger fans, until next time, y'all stay safe. And as always, go Tigers.